So I was surprised by this when I first read the Bible in Luke chapter 4 because, you know, there's these great things happening in Luke. He, chapter 1 and 2 is the Christmas story, pretty much. You always hear about the shepherds out in the field and, you know, amazing testimonies of, of the Messiah coming. And then you get to chapter 3 and his cousin John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And then we get to 4 and it says in verse 1, when Jesus returned from his baptism in the Jordan River, he was, come on. Full of the Holy Spirit. Remember that? When he came up out of the water, what, what, help me out. What happened? He comes up out of the water. You don't have to raise your hand. You're so polite, y'all. Come on. They saw like a, a dove coming down and settling on him. And, and, and they heard a voice. This is my beloved son. And who well, well, please. Like, that's not something you see every day. So it was some kind of powerful thing happened when he got baptized. And then all of a sudden, it says here, he's full of the Holy Spirit coming from the baptism. And then the Holy Spirit leads him to his new ministry, to a book publishing company to tell his story. <laughs> Bummer. No. To the wilderness. I thought you'd love me, God. He does. Maybe he wants us to know that he can operate in the wilderness. That just because you're in the wilderness doesn't mean he's not there with you. That's what I learned from my mother. We were in a wilderness, and she had something I didn't have. And that's access to God's kingdom is, is one of the ways we would say it in, in our vernacular here. That the kingdom of God is available to us while we're here. Let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That doesn't mean come down and kill me so I can go, go get my new mansion in heaven. It means, no, that we operate cooperate with God and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the body of Christ to see his kingdom come to pass. When Lisa got healed this morning, when James got delivered from the, the, the critters that, that were haunting him called demons, it was the power of God, not the power of man that did that. It can't be about persuasive words. It has to be the demonstration of the power. So the first thing Jesus does on his assignment is to confront the ruling spirit of this world. That's what the wilderness does. We shouldn't be afraid of the wilderness. God operates. Light belongs in the darkness. We should be with the lost, not afraid of the lost. And what does the devil do? What he does best, he lies. He makes you challenge your identity. If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread because Jesus had been fasting. So naturally the devil knows he's going to be hungry. And Jesus has this wonderful answer. Every time Satan asks a question, he starts with the same three words. It is written, Satan, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Mouth of God. So I get my food from hearing my father's voice. How about you? We could say that too. You know the enemy's going to lie, but if you don't have the truth in you, then you're losing some immune system immunity. The truth is the only medicine that beats the lie. And sometimes it's got to be revelatory truth. It's not always what it looks like on the surface. Because then Satan takes him up on the top and, and, and this mountain and sees this whole big vast expanse. And he says, this has all been given to me. <laughs> and if you just fall down and worship me, I'll give it to you. And Jesus is probably like, God, that's the best you got? Really? That's the best you got? <laughs> and uh, like, I uh, know, I don't worship anything but my father. Like, I've been with him forever. You're the one that didn't worship him. So he quotes that scripture. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only. Have no other gods. And then he says, okay, here's one. Psalm 91 says he will give his angels charge over you. So why don't you just throw yourself off the roof and let's prove it. And he's like, you're going downhill with your examples here. The last one was lame. This is even more lame. Why would I throw myself off the roof? I know my God's going to protect me. But he said, don't test him. I don't have to test my father. So I love the language here. Open enrollment is the way I look at it. Like all of us have a choice. We can decide if we want to live our lives with partial gospel and partial world. Or that we can go all in and say, I want to be a Navy SEAL, and I know i got to go through Hell Week, but I'm coming out the other side, and it's going to be Semper Fi, we're in this thing. Because it's like being pregnant. You can't be part pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. 
all right? So we get pregnant with God, and he delivers babies that are, are the new creations that are going on all around us. And, and it's new creation when you're in Christ. And again, this is not, it could sound a little legalistic that you have to live up to all these rules. No, he's our teacher. And there's open enrollment in the Jesus school of life. And there's no tuition other than you have to pick up your cross every day. It's 11.56. I'm keeping my eye on the clock. In case you think regret is the only form of waste howling wilderness, I just want to let you know it's not. Okay? I already mentioned I was a drug addict. So that's a really bad scene when I tell you. Horrible scene. But it's not just drug addiction. It could be pornography. It could be gambling. It could be so many things in our culture today that, that have people off, off the 100% identity of who they should be. It's not redemptive to be addicted to something. And if you say, oh, yeah, I heard Maria Murillo say this. I could quit, I could quit smoking any time I wanted. I've done it 100 times. <laughs> right? So this is what people do. Like, no, you can't stop. If you're worried about whether you're addicted, try to stop for a month. See what happens. Stop drinking coffee. Have some Tylenol ready for that one. It could be the wilderness of a divorce. And there's not, nothing funny about this. Try and be a single mom, you know, with all the bills and how expensive it is to live around here, never mind the betrayal that you would feel and so many other things. And does that mean it's going to be easy? No, but it means that if, you, if you're in Christ, you're going to have more tools and you're going to be strong to give hope to your children. And we have so many testimonies sitting in this room right now that I don't have time to share, but trauma, there's so many other things that we could look at. But the one thing that's in common that I think is the word anguish. You know something's not settled. You're living in anguish because you're in this wilderness and you, and you don't have a, an answer to go to. So you wake up in the middle of the night and you're wondering about how the bills are going to get paid or, you, or, you, or you're wondering about whether you can trust this person or if, ah, there's a million examples. That's not the peace of God. And in order, you know, if we stand up here and say, well, you know, if you just had more faith, please, we're here even in the times of pain, we're supposed to help each other and not blame them that they're, they're waking up at night because they just don't read the Bible enough. Oh, my God. Don't do that to people. Have some compassion. Put an arm around the shoulder. Let them know, I'm not going anywhere. You're not alone. I'm not going anywhere. 